Hello, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's October 5th, 2022, and on the show today, we have Arusha Piras, as always, joining me, Justin Nielsen. Of course, Arusha is a portfolio manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm, I'm doing well and, and very excited for our guest today. Yes, very excited. Uh, of course, Arusha had him back when he was the the host uh, extraordinaire, but it's great to be welcoming back uh, truly a legend in the field. Yeah. It's Tom Dorsey, who is the founder of Dorsey Wright. That was uh, sold to NASDAQ back in 2015. Um, welcome back to the show, Tom. Thank you. Always a pleasure. So, I always enjoy being with you guys. <laughs> so, Tom, we've got so much to kind of, uh, you know, walk through with you. And I, I guess maybe a great place to start is, I mean, I usually think of you as being, you know, the, the point and figure guy. Um, yeah. Here McDonough, uh, he, he was someone who was speaking with us for a while. And, you know, he was the one that introduced me to point and figure. And he just said, look, you know, this is this is telling you so much information. And he, you know, uh, you know showed me what you were doing mm -hmm. over at Dorsey Wright. I mean, this was probably 20 years ago. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into the point and figure charting system and, and how you kind of got into the business a little bit. Well, that's an inter interesting question. Um, because most things, most things that, that happen good to people are accidental. All <laughs> of a sudden you walk, you walk into it. Yeah. You know, and there it is. You 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 weren't even looking for it, but something smacks you in the face and says, oh, my God, this is my direction. Well, when I was a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch back in 1974, 73, 74, you, you hear the people on TV talking about 73, 74. Yes. I mean, that was that was um, that was when we had to get in line for for gasoline. You're you're yeah. you had a certain number on your your plate that would allow you to go that day. And it was your turn. It was, it was tough back then, 73, 74. And that's when I started as a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch. So I'm 20 something years old and I come back from Merrill Lynch training school in New York city. And I'm ready to save the world. I'm riding in on a white horse. I'm ready to, to sell and, and to, to raise money. Nobody ever told me we, they just gone through a bear market. Nobody. Mm -hmm. except the people I was prospecting. And I would, <laughs> and I would call people up every day. This when you, this when you were allowed to call people and, 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 and try to get business. And I would say this probably a hundred times a day. Good morning, Mr. Jones. My name is Tommy Dorsey. And I want to make sure I said Tommy Dorsey because these were old people who remembered the Tommy Dorsey band in the 1940s. Uh-huh, right. Tommy Dorsey uh -huh. and Jimmy Dorsey. So it was a great lead in. They get some name recognition. Them. Yeah. So I said, hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Tommy Dorsey. My company's Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith. The reason I called is twofold. First, I'd like to introduce myself. And second, I'd like to avail the services of my firm to you. Do you invest? Open ended question. Mm -hmm. They would come back in 1974 and say, Mr. Dorsey, I don't want to become acquainted with you. You can go to hell. <laughs> the, second guy, the second guy I'm talking to or lady and says, Mr. Dorsey, you're a stockbroker, right? Uh, yes, ma'am, I am. Uh, well, that's what happened to me with my last stock broker. He made me just that broker. And, and I'll see you later. Crash. And I thought, this is a difficult business. Nobody told me they had just been wiped out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here I am, 20-something on a white horse, and I've got the answers, right? I don't have any answers. I had what Merrill Lynch was telling me. <clears throat> so after that first year, I said, you know what? If I'm going to be successful in this business, I better become an expert at something. Yeah. Yeah. So I looked around the office. I said, what are people not doing? Well, options had just debuted two years earlier at the CBOE. And mm -hmm. I said, that's my direction. So I took a legal pad to pencil home every weekend and nights. And I worked on options doing arithmetic on a, on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. That stuck in my mind like I'll never forget that because you had no computers. You had no right. handheld calculators. You had, no, you had nothing back then. So you had a piece of paper and a pencil, and that's where I worked it out. And I, joined, I, I, I be, began to love options. Well, long story short, Wheat First Securities got to know me. They were across the street, large regional brokerage firm. Many people know Wheat First Securities' name. 
And they offered me the opportunity to come over and develop and manage their first option department. Wow. And I said, I'm doing it. So I came across the street and it was just me and a secretary. And I hired that first guy that brought this book in. So that's the luck of the draw. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, somebody brings a paperback book, this one right here. Yep. And, for, and for those who are listening, it's a three-point reversal method of point and figure. Mm -hmm. That that cost four ninety five, right? Right, Tom. <laughs> cost four dollars and ninety five cents, and that's by Cohen. Yeah, mm -hmm. by A. W. Cohen. Yes. And these, yes. They were doing this back in the forties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this is nothing new that we figured out that you could divide something by something and get a number. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I saw the way they had done this chart craft and investor intelligence. I said, I, I, I've, I've got to tell everybody about this. Yeah. So I took a lost art, and I. I redid it and 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 sold it to the professionals in this business and changed a lot of lives doing that so for me that was a great opportunity to combine options with with stocks mm -hmm. so i've always been a big covered writer and a ratio writer and and you know like i mentioned to you guys the other day um i go in every day still i'm 75 years old and i go in every day and I trade options and I, it's not trading options per se. I sell naked straddles and strangles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, what I do is I take a closed end portfolio, which I think is for anybody my age, that's what you need. You don't need the pie in the sky anymore. I mean, when you're 75 years old, it's time to have the pie on the table. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, Tom, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that part in the second segment. Okay. Let's let's go cool. into the market stuff and talk about. Um, the bullish percent and let's just yeah. talk about just kind of the, the larger market and with point and figure how you know how you learned about bullish percent you know it was you know at the the mid 80s and then there's there, that special day in in 87 <laughs> but walk us through that um, kind, kind of thing where it really kind of set set you guys apart yeah that was a seminal day uh, Arusha I'm telling you man that was when I started Dorsey Wright and Associates it was January 1987 and everybody can think back, even if you didn't live through that time, we went through on the 19th of October, 1987, the equivalent of a 22% decline. That would be like the sand, not like the Dow Jones going down 6,000 points in a day. Yeah. yeah. Now, in, in 2020, we saw it go down 3,000 in a day. We, so we've seen half of that. But those were the times when you had to really understand how to look at the market and the bullish percent was it there was no verbiage there the bullish percent is simply a calculation of the percentage of stocks on the new york stock exchange that have point and figure buy signals mm -hmm. so if i took a fourth grader and i said here's 2000 stocks look at each chart tell me when you look at the chart the the last thing you see if it's a column of x's exceeding a previous column of x's stack it over here and then when you stack all those up over there, we'll divide by the total. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. your bullish percent. Yep. Plain because you simple. didn't have an Excel spreadsheet to put all this in, right? <laughs> well, right on the computer. I mean, you don't have an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, it's just you type in BPNYSE, bingo, it comes right up. And you can mm -hmm. do anything you want with it. Mm -hmm. So you, when you look at – I looked at the times – that where we are right now. Well, first, let me. Well, let yeah, me let's go, go to 87. Here, let's talk about 1987. Yeah. When I started the company, the only thing that we knew for the market per se was the bullish percent index. Mm -hmm. That was our guide, plain and mm -hmm. simple. We didn't have all this other minutia and things that people talk about and nobody can understand. This is straightforward, simple. If this index is above 70%, you are in a, a, a point where it's you're considered very high and high, very risky. Mm -hmm. A reversal down from there would put you on defense. No yes. question about it. Down below 30% is the exact opposite. That's where people have capitulated, sold everything out, and now they're sitting there, they've got the cash, and, and, and nothing's happening. Well, all of a sudden the market begins to pick up. The bullish percent reverses back up from below 30%. Now, below 30% is the key. That's the promised land. Mm -hmm. You know where we are today, Rusha? No, no, I, I don't know. 18%. Wow, wow. That is the promised land. Now, when you go back 
a number of years, you say, okay, where was this? In 2008, it got down to 2%. Oh, my God. So 98% wow. of the stocks in 2008 had negative chart configuration. That's 2011, it got down to 16%. 2016, down to 20. 2018, down to 14. 2022, we're at 18% now. And my guess is tomorrow it reverses up. Okay. Because so we you- are within a fraction of it reversing. So it's not a matter of whether the market was up today or was not today. It's a configuration of the chart patterns. Yes, underneath the surface. Underneath the surface. Yes. That's right. Yep. So my guess, Irusha, is tomorrow and Justin that we reverse up. Once that reverses up into a column of X's, that's the point at which we're in what's called bull alert status. Okay. That's like coming up to a stoplight and it's flashing yellow. Well, mm-hmm. flashing yellow, you could go through it. You should slow down, stop, look both ways, and proceed with caution. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're going to be when this reverses up, and it's probably going to happen tomorrow. And and then what, when does it go into – so if it gets back above 30, that's now bullish trend? Was it... Yes, that's bullish okay. when it goes back above 30. Okay. Mm-hmm. The last time this happened, and I think I mentioned it on your program, we got a hell of a rally, and August 29th, um, it reversed back down. So I went up, well, I go on Twitter. When these things happen, yeah. I go on Twitter and I say, okay, bullish percent reversed down. Um, it's, it's time to be very cautious, et cetera. I don't say a lot, but yep. just to let them know. Um, because in India, they do a ton of relative strength. Mm. I mean, oh, are you talking about the Indian stocks or just? Yes. 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 The Indian, Indian stock market is very, very strong. Yeah, there, there is, there is. See, I've done a lot of business in India, uh-huh. and I did a, a a rickshaw run, a wild adventure in India. Wow! This is the wildest you could be driving a three wheel vehicle, three thousand kilometers. <laughs> oh my gosh! Where, where you have never been before, uh-huh. and it's like you get one day to practice it and then have fun. Your only your only rules are, get from here, to the point A to point B. And point B is 3,000 kilometers away. So <laughs> it sounds like an amazing race reality yeah. show or something. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, it is. They, they do this constantly in India. That's what's so cool is there are three trips around India each year. And it's, it's, the, it's the tuk-tuk. So you go from, from uh, northwest to southwest, from southwest to northeast, northeast to the Himalayas, the Himalayas back to the um, western coast. And you, you pick those up around. So if anybody could go online and say, type in the adventurists, and you'll see the coolest, crazy adventure you've ever experienced. And you guys should do you guys should do I, I, I think we might have to do really the podcast on the, on the road. Yeah. Get, get, get two more friends yeah. and go do it. Wow. And it'll be the greatest adventure you've ever, ever, ever had. When did you when, when did you do that? Well, I mean, we're going off on this uh, tangent. 2011. Here, but... It was 2011. Okay. That is amazing. I was the oldest person on that trip, and it was fantastic. And I'm thinking now at 75, hell, I'll, I'll go do it again. Well, wow. may, maybe you're our other other person. Yeah, we, just we, we need one, one more. more, Tom. We need one more. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> Road trip. <laughs> so, 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 but, so, yeah, you were talking about the the, the bullish percentage here, and yeah, you got to keep everything. me online. <laughs> yeah. So let, let, let's go back to 1987. So yeah. what was what was it telling you in 1987? Yeah, here's what here's what happened. 1987. We watched it very, very carefully. And in September, it was around September 4th, 5th, 6th, somewhere in, somewhere in that area, the bullish percent reversed from above 70% down. And that's when we went online and just pounded the table that you got to do something. We just didn't know better except to do that. You know, from a defense. high level, going on defense, yeah. we, in essence, lucked out that mm-hmm. the market went down 28% in a day. And, but we had everything documented and what we had said. So it saved the company. Yeah. It really, the bullish percent saved the company. That's so it's become my most important go-to indicator. Mm-hmm. Plain do, you remember, do you remember when it went negative this past year or in 2021? Yeah. When it... Well, I can pull that. I have to pull the chart up. Okay. Well, I mean, we, we could, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, what, do you remember? Was you. Or... No, 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 don't, don't. <laughs> was it 20, was it the beginning of 2022 or 2021? Do you remember? Well, in 20, in, in 
2008, it reversed down, went all the way down to 2%. Yeah. In, 20, in 2018, it went down to 14%. Yeah. 2022, it's now down to 18%. Okay. Okay. Now, we have, we've, we've had some great rides here to yep. trade. When that bullish percent was in X's, I mean, we've got a, a 30% rise in that thing. Yeah. yeah. Been a good, a good play, this last buy signal. And when it said sell August 29th, said defense, come on, man, mm. defense, yep. it was dead on the money. Yep. Now we've gone through so much friggin' pain and it's down at the 18% level. That's capitulation. Mm -hmm. People have sold. It, yeah. They've sold out. Unless, so unless their dad gave him some Coca-Cola at $1 that he bought way back when it's in the lockbox. It's not going on the market. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But every, everything that could be sold has been. I think I think it has. When you look at the bullish percent, absolutely. When it gets down to this level and you're below 30, actually below 20 percent, that's the promised land. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Now, what can happen here? This reverses back up. I'll be the first one to get in. I will let everyone know that it is reversed back up. The offensive team is on the field. And here's where we need is we need to do. One of the things that the simple things to do is just buy the SSO, the double beta standard. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You don't have to go mess around with stocks and try to do this and try to do that. Um, buy the SSO, the double beta mm -hmm. and sit I back. And so, relax. So, so talk about now when you look back at the S&P 500 back from November 7th of 2019, uh, till now, you know, t talk about that. Where are we when you compare the, the what, where, when you compare those two in, in the market? Well, that's a, that's, that's a multilateral question mm -hmm. because where are we? We're sitting right now in the doldrums. We're, we're in the promised land. We're as sold out as you can be. Everyone has sold stock. Nobody wants to be in the market. Couldn't get any worse. The only way we can go from here is to zero. We've never been there, never been down that low. Mm -hmm. um, we've gotten down in 2008. I think we got as low as 2008, 2%. 98% of all stocks had been sold out and were on sell signals in yeah. 2008. That's the, the real capitulation. Okay. But when you look at this bullish percent now at 18%, it's sold out. Mm -hmm. Now, what about your son? Now, your son was very worried about the market yeah. and things like that talk, talk a little bit about that because i think a lot of people are going where you know obviously there's a lot of bad news out there yes. um, talk, talk about your experience and your, your conversation with your son well i sent i sent uh the young lady i was talking to yesterday a picture of a shirt my it was a picture of my son yes, you know, yes. Maybe want, I, I don't know if you can put it on the podcast or not but my son came to my house one day thomas and thomas is he knows what I know. And this kid, I mean, he's like 41 years old, but he, he's, he knows everything I know. And he comes to my house and he says, dad, he says, I'm starting to get worried about this market. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about the world. You know, let's talk about it. And I said, sit down, Tom. When I was in the business in 1974, the S&P or the Dow Jones was at 500. Mm -hmm. Now, the Dow Jones at that point when we were talking was at 34,000. I said, we wound, wound down Vietnam. We've been into Iraq, Iran, uh, Afghanistan. We've had 9-11. We've had everything you can think of go wrong. And the, yes, the Dow Jones at 34,000. 500 to 34,000 with all that trouble that we had during that period. So the same thing has happened. When I did your podcast before, and this was 2019. Right. Um, 2019, I said, I think uh, we're beginning a, a 20 year bull market. Well, I couldn't have been wrong on more wrong on my timing. Mm -hmm. um, by, by 2020, as you know, I mean, the Dow Jones was going down 3,000 points in a day, 2,000, 1,000. I mean, it was terrible. And I was laying in a hospital after an operation watching it on TV. I had no computer, nothing. I'm watching my portfolio. Go <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> Lord. Oh my God. You know what next? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so it, it was very bad in 2020, 2019 is when I said we're in a 20 year bull market. I still believe that. Yeah. But we have gone through so much trouble since then. But since that day that I mentioned that mm -hmm. we're up 
34 percent in the S&P 500. Even as far down as we've come. Yeah. It's What's off up with the that? high. We're What's still up with that. Yeah. In the S&P 500, we trust. And those are the, t- <laughs> and those are the, those are the T-shirts. You Plain know, and right? simple. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll have to put that out on Twitter. Uh, now, w- one one last question here on the market here, because, I mean, you've, you've talked about this bullish percentage. You've talked about your point and figure charts and, and all these signals. I, I haven't heard you talk so much about the macroeconomic. I mean, we've got, you know, the Fed, what the, what the Fed is doing. We've got war in Ukraine. We've got all of these things. And I guess maybe this goes back to what you told your son. But do any of these macroeconomic uh, considerations come into your thinking at all here? They don't. Mm-hmm. Just that simple. They don't, they don't at all. Mm-hmm. You know where those macro considerations come? Hmm. Into the bullish percent. Right. You see it in the chart, right? Yes. You see yeah. it in the bullish percent because what's the bullish percent? The bullish percent is all the people that are operating in the markets and they're buying and selling and whatnot. And when you aggregate them all and you say, wait a minute, there's, there's a plethora of buys coming in there that it sells, probability is markets moving higher. Mm-hmm. I don't need to listen to CNBC. I don't need to listen to anything else. I can look at that bonus percent and know exactly what I need to do. Mm-hmm. So it keeps things simple. Yes. Mm-hmm. Keeps things simple. Well, and I think uh, that's that's kind of the name of the game here. So I, I think one of the things that you shared with us that uh, you felt like your two biggest classes that uh, kind of set you up were the Econ 101 and the Stats 101. It just Absolutely. became that simple for you. So That was the most important two courses of my life. And I think about these all the time, like regression to mean. You take off in the morning and you're heading out and you're, you're late for work and you're speeding down the road and all of a sudden you hit a red light. Mm-hmm. You got regressed to mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the little old lady from Pasadena pulls up next to you <laughs> and she's smiling at you. You say, oh, God, I'm embarrassed. Light turns green. I take off trying to go to the next light as fast as I can. Turns red. I get yeah. regressed to mean. Little old yeah. lady from Pasadena pulls there up. There she is pulling up right next to you. In her uh-huh. 1948 Ford, and she's laughing at me now. Yeah. She's found <laughs> the exact rate of speed to go to catch all the lights. I haven't. Uh-huh. I so that. that's the embarrassing part is when you you keep getting regressed to mean in life. When a person, you ever you ever known someone that got too big for the britches? Oh, yeah. They got oh. regressed to mean probably. Yep. Something hey, happened. Just look at me in my twenties. Uh, that's basic. <laughs> yeah, that's basic statistics. Yeah, mm-hmm. I love it. I love statistics. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's a good place to kind of end this segment. And when we come back, we're going to get into a little bit more of the strategies that you're using now, and uh, what what you think is something a lot of people can use for their own portfolios. So cool. stay tuned. We'll be right back. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here along with my weekly star guest, Arusha Pires, who is a O'Neill Portfolio Manager, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager, and our special guest this week, it's a legend, it's Tom Dorsey, uh, creator, founder of Dorsey Wright, which is now owned by NASDAQ. And Tom, we were talking before about how simple you make it. And so, you know, that, that's, that's what you do for the market. Now let's talk about individual stocks. How is it that you go about finding those winning stocks, the ones that you want to invest in, uh, over, over all the other choices you have out there? Well, I do it exactly as we have been talking here. We have at Dorsey Wright, we have all these portfolios that are already put into the portfolio system. Mm-hmm. Every portfolio has a matrix that runs on it every day. So every day you go and click view and you see that, that, that mathematical division one, here's your list. And so we have that on every single portfolio that we have. So I only have to go 
to, let's say I'm interested in oil. I can go to oil and I can go to oil service. I can go to oil Exxon type companies and whatnot and run the programs and see which ones are the best. And I have no problem just buying the five best. And so it's, it's judging it by relative strength, right? Right, Tom? Yes, exactly. Yeah. But here's the thing, Rusha. Where this market is going is IT. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. Anyone that is still trying to fight that, you can't do it. Because IT has the answer. As long as you have the data that you can massage and manipulate with IT, you don't have to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's done. I can, I can ask Siri. She yeah. tells me. I just... <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Siri questions and she tells me exactly where to go before I could even type it in. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, so we're we're at that stage now where AI is the name of the game. And that's why brokerage firms are going that way. I heard I heard one of the top people at Merrill Lynch the other day said mentioned that if you're a customer of Merrill Lynch, you're gonna be on a team. Well, when I was at Merrill Lynch, you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. You you got a broker, and that broker was your guy. And he's the one that helped you invest yeah. and do well. Now it's, you're going to be on a six person team. So everyone can handle your insurance. They can handle this and this and that and this and that. These things are simple. And the, and the further we get into AI, this business of people giving investment advice is going to go the way of the dodo bird. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Right. So now you were talking about this, this whole matrix and the, the division that you do. What, what, what exactly is it you're dividing? And again, it, it's, it's very simple here. What, what, what's your, what are you dividing here? Yeah. Well, here, uh, as I mentioned to Rusha back in um, the last podcast we did, let's say that you were only allowed to invest in Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, you go to Goldman Sachs and you get a report on Pepsi-Cola and it's the greatest company since sliced bread. Thick report written by a guy, PhD from Yale. I mean, three-piece suit, everything you could want. Who's going to read it? But you can look at the chart and go with it. But <laughs> then I go to go to Morgan Stanley and get a, get a report on, 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 on uh, Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola, best company you could possibly invest in. I mean, this is... The, it's the product of America. Mm -hmm. Well, which one am I going to invest in? Both of them are fundamentally sound. So I got to put them through an arm wrestling contest. And here's the way you do it. To create a relative strength chart, you divide one thing by another. So in other words, let's pull a couple number names numbers out of the air. Let's say Coca-Cola is at 100, which is not, and Pepsi is at 50, which is not. Um, if I divided 50 into 100... That's Pepsi into Coke. I get two mm -hmm. because Coke's 100, Pepsi's 50. Then I add a zero to make it easier to chart. So I chart that on a point and figure basis. On that point and figure basis, when I chart that, it's not, it's not a price chart. It's a relative chart between the two of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it shows me which one, when it's in a column of X's and rising, exceeding, when, when it's on a buy signal and rising, you own the numerator, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. When it's on a sell signal and declining, you own the denominator. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have pr a problem at all. When that relative strength chart switched from one, th one to the other, I would have no problem selling one and buying the other. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, now, well, so, now, so now when you're looking at, so, so you, you go to an industry group, the oil and services group, you're choosing the top five or, or the top five stocks in, in, in whatever sector. After they've um, all arm wrestled each other. They, they've all arm wrestled each other. Now it's giving you, you have the top five here. How right. often do you switch that out? Is it a, is it a kind of a, on a monthly basis or are you letting the market and the stocks themselves handle it? Rusha, the market handles it. Mm -hmm. I mean, who am I to put those five in and then say, okay, I'm looking at this and say, ah, oh, well, we got a problem with, with uh, Ukraine and we got a problem with the nuclear stuff. We got a problem. No, hell no. When, when that indicator changes, I'm changing. Yo. I don't have to do anything else. Period. So like in Indonesia, yeah. when a change takes place in my portfolio there, they do it automatically. Wow. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're, they're tied into Dorsey, right? And whenever they get the change comes up, they send the change to them. Yo. This is, I mean, you should be able to run a billion-dollar portfolio from a cruise ship with an iPhone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plain and simple. Now, you do give it a little bit of room, though, right? So if it if it drops from 
number five to number six or number seven, you give it a little bit of room, kind, kind of, kind of like a baseball picture, right? Exactly. I let it go to number ten. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you could set up your own system the way you want it, <clears throat> but number ten is like that pitcher who walked too many people, got too many home runs hit off him, too many things accumulated when the coach had to come out and take him out mm-hmm. and bring a new guy in that's been been warmed up, yep. and that's what happens. So you give you give you give the stocks room to drop from number five to number 10 and that's that's the pitcher you know blowing it and having to go into the dugout but once you get down number 10 then you're going to make that swap okay and then number six goes up to number five or something number six goes in okay Mm -hmm. yeah and again it's just that simple again relative strength is long term Ruja. it's relative strength can last two to two and a half years yeah Mm. yeah Mm -hmm. and again here again you're using that point figure kind of to just guide you in terms of when those changes are happening the reversals the um you know the trends right that's right Mm -hmm. because that's all you're going to look at when you come to work each day you're going to look at let's say your favorite sectors that you like see see the 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 calculations on the relative strength that are done every night every night and see what the top five are Mm -hmm. yep so now, Tom, you were mentioning kind of in the in the last segment, you, you you started to talk about it a little bit, and you know maybe we could get into it a little bit more. The strategy that you're using now, um, you know, with with closed end funds, you know, and okay, let's get into that a little bit. Great, that's important. The people that I deal with with closed end fund is Susan Horowitz, and it's called Big Whale, their mm-hmm. company. So go go search them, Big Whale. They're the best in the closed end funds. I learned about closed end funds by accident. Again, everything happens by accident. (laughs) You know, this lady came to me and and asked me if I could help her market her closed end fund business. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and I thought, this is really cool what she's got here. I said this, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, people 75, do I want my pie in the sky anymore? Or do I want it on the table? Yeah. I want it on the table. And I want to start spending my income. I don't need to make more income to give to the kids when I die. That's for me and my wife, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and that's what we do with the closed end funds. They're very high yield. They're low volatility. But the interesting thing about the closed end funds is you can margin. So I have a portfolio of closed end funds that I put on margin. Mm-hmm. And then what I'll do each day, and this is only because they changed the rules and options uh, last couple of years where they have one day options. One day. They come they in expire the morning, in a day. That's, that's all you it. get. Four <laughs> o'clock, they are history. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's, it's like going to Coney Island and, and getting an ice cream cone at nine o'clock in the morning. And you stand out on, on the sand <laughs> and all day. It's July. It's July. <laughs> and you watch that ice cream cone melt. That's called theta. Yeah, that's uh-huh. what I want. Time to I want the melt. I don't. I don't want to be a hero. I don't want to be, you know, some kind of great trader or anything. I just want the melt. So I, I want at the end of the day to increase the value of my portfolio, or at least mitigate any losses that I have in it. So I keep the portfolio stable. If 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 it's the best thing I can do is keep it stable. Great. If I can make money doing this. Then I do, and typically that that's exactly what happens. And so, Tom, what that. what options are you trading? So you're taking the margin from the the closed end fund. What options are you trading? What are the these daily options that that you Here, trade off of? Here's what I do. Here's what I do in the morning. First thing I get up in the morning, and I can't wait to get in because once <laughs> the market opens, I just love it. Yep. And the option market, what I do there. Is this sound? It's naked straddles and naked strangles. And what's a naked straddle and a strangle? A naked strangle is something that I do every day. And let's say, let's pull out a number, say the SP is at 3,000, make that number. Mm-hmm. I'll come in in the morning, and what I'll do is I'll sell a 3,100 call and I'll sell a 2,900 put. Those are my goalposts. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm going out on my football field. I'm setting my goalposts and I'm praying that the game is played between the goalposts. Mm -hmm. If it's played between the goalposts, I'm on Coney Island with, with two ice cream cones. Yeah. 
And that's called theta. And that's and that's melting. And it happens so fast. It's so interesting once you understand this. The key to not losing money doing this is don't over leverage. Over leverage is the kiss of death. Yes. You can do these in a portfolio. Let's say you get qualified to do uncovered strangles and you're going to put one contract on a time. That's it. One call, one put. Those are my goalposts. And then I'm going to pray that this day stays between those two goalposts. If it doesn't, I have to move the goalpost. Okay. You know, so all days I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving and grooving with this, but the days that are great is when you sit here. It, well, it's Maytag repairman days. Do you remember the, the Maytag repairman? Yeah, right, right. Days? I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're Doing nothing, days, right? <laughs> you know? That's, that's what we want. This is the Maytag repairman strategy. Uh-huh. Is when you put this on, you want to sit there like this guy just all day. <laughs> Nothing happening, man. Because <laughs> I, now... I got great washers and dryers, and they don't break. You know? yeah. Now, now when you've got a more volatile market, um, I mean, in order to get it to stay within your range, are you kind of making wider goalposts? Do you, like, change the, uh, I guess, change the distance between those goalposts, depending on your market? I will make the goalposts as wide as I possibly can. Okay. And that will that will dictate what the what the VIX is, the volatility index. The more volatility, the wider I can be. Because yeah. I don't I'm not interested in getting in the ring and throwing blows on anybody. I'd rather get in the ring and just have both guys sit there and wait until yeah. the tenth tenth round and say, Okay guys, see you later. I'm out of here. <laughs> let's, let's let's take our money. <laughs> yeah, let me pick up my check, I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's what I do. The key to it though is when you think about what I started doing is is trying to create a an income stream to an individual who understands this and is willing to do it, and you don't have to have a lot of money to do it. Do one contract at a time, yeah. And mm-hmm. you're going to do two contracts. You're going to one is going to be a call. That's that's one of your um, goalposts. The other is going to be a put. One by one, nobody gets hurt. But one by one, you could make yourself 700 bucks a day, and that's $140,000 a year on 270 trading days. That's not bad for somebody who's willing to do one lots. Yeah, yeah. You know, you come and put you put your one lot on and make it wide as you possibly can and go have breakfast. Yeah. Now, now we have to ask about the risk management side because sometimes you're going to have those days where, man, that, that ball just went right out, out, out of your goalpost. You know, some news came out, what have you, and yeah. – it's right out of the goalpost. So do you we have had that happen in the last couple of days? Look at look at the way the market has gone the last couple of days. That's exactly what has happened. Mm-hmm. But by the next day, something else happens and you have lost a day of time value. You see? So what I'll do is people don't want to do what I do. I'll do 30, 40, 50 contracts at a time on, on each side. Do not try That's this dangerous. at home. You better know what you're doing to do that. Yeah, for sure. But if you're doing one contract, and let's say you're looking to make 500 bucks a day, mm-hmm. 500 times 270 days, that's not a bad piece of change for somebody. Yeah. And we're talking one lot. Yeah. Well, so, so like anything else, you start small and slowly learn, you know, that's over right. time, right? And just like you're saying there, Rusha, is leverage... Absolutely. Excess leverage is the kiss of death in this, yep. because all of a sudden you're used to one lots, and then you do a ten lot, yeah. <laughs> and oh lord, yeah. something bad happens, or something good happens. You do a twenty lot, then you do a thirty lot, and then yeah. it, it 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 gets out of control. The idea is to set up the concept of what you want to do. You want to make yourself one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. This is it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want to make so, two hundred thousand dollars a year. This is it. Stay to stay at least till twelve o'clock in the afternoon. So now this is with the this is with the strangle, you know, yes. with the straddle. With the straddle, you you aren't really having goalposts on either side, you know, because again, like a, a call that you're selling at a higher price and a put that you're selling at a lower price. With a with a straddle, you're you're kind of using the same strike price. So exactly, what what, what is it that you're doing there differently? That's a great that's a great question, because the straddles come into play more toward the end of the day. When the volatility okay. starts picking up and you've and you've probably 
experienced all the theta that you're going to get from a position, then it becomes um, delta, i.e. volatility. Mm -hmm. And by that time, you've already lost enough premium, you're going to pick up four or $500 in that day. Mm -hmm. and, and multiply that times 270 trading days a year. Person could go to Tahiti and relax for six months. <laughs> right. Now, was this, some of the, was this some of the stuff that you were writing down on the, the yellow pad years ago in the, in the 70s when you were kind of putting the, all this no, together? No, this no, is, no, this no. Was, I, never, no. I never thought about this. Okay. Back in the 70s, the only reason I thought about this is when they changed the rules and they made one-day options. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. That changed the ball game for me. Yeah. One day options when I can get into it and out of it by the end of the day. Now, okay. here's the interesting thing, too, is the government gives you a tax break on this. If you're trading index options, just like index futures, wow. it's a 60-40. Wow. I didn't so 60% of your gains are going to yeah. be short, going to be long term. 40% will be short term. So you get a, a, a great tax break doing it. Yeah. So that's another reason why I do the indexes. Plus, the indexes are so liquid, you can get in and out right. in a half a second. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll put a position on. Let's say S&P 500 is at 3,000. And I'll sell uh, 3,600 and a 3540 put 3,600 call. If I do one by one, which I do every day, because I'm... I'm, I'm I'm trying to build this concept of a person having an income doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I do this every single day. And I would say 90% of the time it works out well. Sometimes it doesn't. And the market blows past you and you end up with a $1,500 loss. That's okay. That's life on Wall Street. Right. Mm -hmm. You're going to make that up. Right. That's going to come on the next good day. Yep. But you're only doing one contract at a time. So you're not going to be out at dinner and I wonder, oh, God. I, you know, if you, you take home a twenty, you take home a twenty lot. Yeah, you ain't sleeping. Right, right. <laughs> but that's what mo that's what a lot of people do, though, right? I'm sure yeah. you've run across tons of clients like that over the years who they would just jump and they would over lever themselves and get themselves too much into trouble. That's right. It's over leverage that's the killer. Yeah, okay. and it's like Jim Yates, who who was my mentor many years ago, great option guy. He wrote the book, The Option Strategy Spectrum. Um, his concept was whenever you buy a call, he says, hold it till expiration. Hmm. Never trade it. Mm -hmm. So you don't over leverage to begin with. Yeah. If you're normally a 300 share buyer, you buy three calls. Right. Mm -hmm. And you hold them until expiration. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now there's no tension. There's yeah. And no over leverage because you're not doing 30 calls. Right. That That's the, where people have to get yeah. <laughs> get to the point where they, oh, I, I have to do something because otherwise I'm going to lose my shirt. Yeah, right. Exactly. This way, when you're not over leveraged, it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. it's going to go off the board at the end of the day. It can go right into the computer system. You don't even have to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the system just adds it all up and takes it. Mm -hmm. So... Just to kind this of sum is, up, is, and this is beautiful. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, one one last thing because you you've mentioned SSO a number of times. So, one other strategy that you're doing sometimes is you're you're using those closed end funds. Um, you're margining those because that's kind of your that's kind of your pie on the table. Your the, your stable part, and mm -hmm. then you're getting the extra income from either these options or sometimes you're just going with SSO, which is the Pro Shares Ultra, two X whatever. The S&P 500 does on a daily basis that does, you know, twice as much up or down. And why is it that you prefer just kind of sticking with the indexes in this case? And again, part of this is going a little bit more conservative. Because you don't, sticking with the indexes, you don't have that problem of one stock coming out and saying, you know, we have yeah. bad earnings right. today right. and we're down 30%. Yeah. That ain't happening with the S&P. And when you're doing one day's, it doesn't matter to you whether the market's going up or down. It's of no consequence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You want to set out your goalposts and 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 try to get the game to play in the in the middle. Mm -hmm. And if you have to move your goalposts, that's okay. But but don't over leverage. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna come out. You're gonna come out ahead. And you're gonna have a lot of fun doing it. Believe me. 
<laughs> now, well, like you said, on the strat on the straddle, it's very similar to pic picture your car driving down the road, and you got your two wheels here, and you're right over that middle strip on the road. Okay, that's your straddle. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, you can pull a lever in your car, and your wheels will go out to the edges of the road. That's your strangle. Mm -hmm. okay. So I get less money out here, but I have less risk. Mm -hmm. I want less risk. Mm -hmm. I can make up the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want. I don't. I don't want the risk. I want. I want to get as as little risk as I possibly can, and then just accumulate that each day. And you have 270 trading days. So whatever you can make in a day, multiply times 270, and that's that's your potential for the year. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've given our audience a lot to think about. It's certainly great hearing from a legend such as yourself, of course, for a lot of people. If you uh, need kind of a refresher on your straddles, your strangles, and, and going naked and all of that, probably good to take a look at some options courses. Uh, we certainly have some options content on investors.com. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and really, really follow that advice of not getting over levered because that, that can be the kiss of death when you're using derivatives. Of course, you get over levered, and that's that's where people get themselves into trouble. So I no, think you're dead right. And you know what people do too? What, what's kind of interesting is watch Tasty Trade. Yeah. Yes. Watch mm -hmm. the live feed, yep. Tasty Trade. These guys yeah, are great. Like those guys. Yeah. You know. So yeah, Tom you can pick up Any uh -huh. knowledge, yep. but yeah. keep it simple for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> Very Please good. And simple. it sounds like from everything that you've just taught us uh, here today, that's that's what your mantra has been. And, yep. Uh, it's yeah, AI. It's AI strength. from here on out. Period. There's no <laughs> right. reason anybody has to go talk to anybody. Yeah. Just go theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we're very glad that you uh, ended up talking to us today, Tom. Thank you yeah, so much Tom, for being on the so show. Much. <laughs> See, I got her coming up now. I'll ask her a question. <laughs> 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 okay, you take care. Okay, well, that was a lot of fun. So make sure that you stay tuned because when we come back, Arusha and I are going to take a look at some of the stocks that are on our radar if this market does turn around. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here along with my co-host and partner in crime, Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors, uh, portfolio manager there. So Arusha, uh, we just kind of heard about the whole relative strength, how to keep it simple. Uh, let's see if we can find some stocks trying sure. to keep it simple. Um, you know, one of the things I've been looking at is just kind of looking at some of the relative strength uh, screens and a, a few stocks that are coming up. Well, there's there's still the oil stocks are not not looking too bad. And one of the stocks that kind of caught my eye was Murphy Oil, uh, ticker symbol MUR. And I mean, this had kind of a breakout today. Volume looks like it's been picking up the last three days as we've rallied. Of course, you have OPEC Plus uh, making the decision that they're going to cut production by two million barrels a day. Uh, what's your take on oil? I mean, we were thinking that this was dead, but uh, this is a legitimate pattern here. Yeah. So yeah, just going off of Murphy Oil, so it is breaking out of a cup with a handle. Now, though, the one kind of concern that I would have with buying it here is it's gone up a, a lot in the last yeah. week and a half or so, right? So it's gone on this really tremendous run, essentially from like a 31, 32, all the way up to 43. So a 30% move. Uh, around there um, in just a week and a half. Uh, so it probably needs to settle down a little bit, but the relative strength lines uh, right at new highs, you're seeing the blue dot there. So it's confirming it's becoming more of a leader in the market. Uh, the base itself looks a little strange here, but you did undercut a lot. Uh, so you probably had a little bit of a shake out here. So I, I think it's worth keeping on the radar, but we're, we're still in a correction. Right. Uh, and this has gone up on such a big run that, 
Um, in this type of environment, you're generally better off letting it settle down, maybe building a smaller, tighter range. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking. Is it just um, that, that that's quite a depth, a 23% uh, depth to the yeah. handle. Uh, a forty-three percent depth to the base. So uh, again, you, know, you have you have, to, you have to put this all in perspective, right? You know, it 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 looks pretty symmetrical, but that's pretty deep on both ends. Um, and of course, you know, we've got to look at USO, which is you know basically a, an ETF that tracks the spot price of oil, and that's been in a downtrend. So you, you got to kind of wonder, okay, there there has been a little bit of a disconnect with some of these oil stocks that have been forming these bases. Granted a little bit deep on some of them but the direction of oil has been in a very you know, very disconnected from that yeah well though the one thing that you also have to think about is that what happens if oil does get going again what happens mm -hmm. if it starts building the right hand side of a base maybe getting above and i'm looking at the uso here getting above the 79 level and the 81 level what does murphy do then right if murphy is right near new highs or uh, breaking out of that cup with handle there and also now you start to see oil moving up. Maybe Murphy Oil uh, really now you have that weight lift off and it's yeah. able to move up. So uh, a lot of times you will see that. I mean, this is almost, you know, there's a microcosm or uh, of kind of the larger market, right? Where you sometimes see the lar the, the overall market still 15% off its highs, but then those best stocks are right within striking distance of a 52 week high and they're breaking out of bases. And then once you kind of get the market to start turning up, those uh, best stocks that were right near new highs, they're really able to move up into all time highs and, and really trend higher. Yeah, very good point. So kind of shifting gears in a, in a different area, uh, one of the things that kind of caught my attention and we did put this on Swing Trader today was Wingstop. Um, it seemed like there were a number of these restaurant stocks that have been showing uh, in interesting action. I mean, this is certainly uh, a, a different take, right? This is still off its highs. It just got back above its 50-day moving average line and its 200-day moving average line. But now, after this really kind of deep, uh, deep correction it suffered in March and April and, and, and May here, now it's kind of resurged uh and 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 kind of reestablished some leadership um back above back above those moving average lines and it really was just kind of hugging that 50-day line over the last few days and then uh what i was looking at today was uh you know kind of an outside day getting back above yesterday's high and what was interesting too was today's action started so negative and once I saw first the Dow Jones Industrial Average get to positive territory, um, a lot of the other indexes were really, you know, coming off their lows and and reducing their gains, pairing their losses. Um, you know, this this one had been on my radar because again, that relative strength looks looks like it's at near term highs. So what's what's your take on something like this, where uh, this isn't this isn't a pattern at this point. It's not anything that the pattern recognition is capturing so is is a bounce off the 50 day enough here yeah well it's you know we we, we had tom dorsey on those first two segments this one is showing relative strength uh and so maybe if you're looking at the what are the top five stocks within the restaurant group maybe wing, wing stop is in there uh the the rs rating for the three month for wing stop is 94 for the six month rs rating is 98. So this one has been outperforming for a little while now, and then it has a 95 normal RS rating, which is a 12-month rating. Uh, you can see over the last couple of months here, every time it, when it's gone up, it's gone up on some pretty big volume here. So something is going on with Wingstop. Uh, it does, Justin, it needs to settle down. It needs yeah. to ideally form a base here because it's just kind of been chopping higher, and that just makes it a lot harder to uh, handle. Uh, and it's also kind of near some critical resistance around that four, 140 area. Uh, so it wouldn't be a surprise to see it settle down here, maybe go sideways and, and kind of uh, deal and, and maybe prepare to try to merge past this uh, key resistance area over the next couple of months or so. But overall, this is another one, really big volume today, big bounce off the, the 50 days, you said, that outside bar. Uh, it's, it's one that's worth keeping an eye on. Um, and they're reporting in uh, three weeks, too. So maybe we'll find out a little bit more of, of how their business is doing. 
Yeah, true. It's it's certainly been one of those things where uh, with with so much of food costs going up, uh, I mean, there were some people saying that the restaurants at least were going up a little bit slower in terms of the inflation there, as opposed to people buying their groceries themselves. Um, you know, it's always, of course, more expensive to go out to eat, but uh, the, 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 the difference was kind of getting narrowed, that gap. So uh, interesting. And hey, we've got football season too. So I mean, I, I'm sure that puts Wingstop on people's radar a little bit more. Well, they are advertising more. I've noticed more commercials on for Wingstop. And also, I think the chicken prices have dropped dramatically. Um, so I, I think that's another reason why it has been able to, to go up. And, and in many ways, they're, they're kind of capturing that chicken wing market. Right. There's a lot of these other chicken wing stores. It's always been a very fragmented market. And here's Wingstop. They built that pretty strong brand name. And, and it looks like they're just continue to slowly increase market share. So, yeah, so may, maybe they kind of uh, grab that whole chicken wing market like a number of other restaurants have done in other uh, other phases in, in, in this in, uh, in the restaurant world. Mm -hmm. Now, outside of the excitement of uh, football and chicken wings and, you know, everything that goes <laughs> along with it, we've got kind of the more boring side, uh, insurance. Uh, now, granted, I'm sure like with uh, something like Ar Arthur J. Gallagher and a lot of these insurance companies, um, the, the devastation that happened in here, you know, with, you know, Hurricane Ian is probably making people think um, a little bit more about insurance companies. Um, but this is this is an area that has held up so well, you know, and, and a lot of times it does, right? It's, it's more defensive in nature. A lot of times you're getting a decent yield from these insurance names, but you just look at that relative strength line on, on AJG here. And again, for people that are um, aware that, you know, we do have this on video, it's at investors.com slash podcast. Um, so we're looking at the chart here on AJG and that, that relative strength line is just screaming higher. Yeah, th this, uh, as, as you said, a lot of the uh, insurance stocks have been able to hang in there. And it's one of the better uh, areas within the financial world uh, that's done well this year, right? It's shown that relative strength. So Arthur Gallagher working on a flat base here on a relative strength basis, a 90 RS rating, and even on a three month and six month time frames, both of those are above 80. So it's been pretty consistent here. It's getting a blue dot. So it's showing our performance underneath this uh, as, as the stock is building a base, it's becoming more of a leader. Uh, and I, I, I guess a lot, a lot of the reason for these insurance stocks, they're able to pass on the costs, mm -hmm. right, right? They're able to kind of rate consistent raise prices on insurance. Now, Arthur Gallagher is more of, of a broker. So right. they're, they're just finding the customers and they're taking a cut. And so mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not even really kind of hanging on to the liability. Um, mm -hmm. But they're also able to increase their prices right so uh, so yeah the insurance business especially when, when the the market is uh, in a downturn and and slowing down uh, a, a, a lot of uh, a, a, lot, a lot of people like to run towards these as you said because of the yield um, and because uh, that they're able to handle more of an inflationary environment better than a lot of other companies yeah absolutely and you know what we might as well just go ahead and uh, end with the market uh just take a real quick there uh the nasdaq composite um you know basically what we saw last week was we saw an undercut of the recent rally attempt uh so that started the count over now the nasdaq did hold above its its june lows as did the russell 2000 and um, you know, yesterday was really strong. We had a very strong Tuesday, um, some volume pickup on that, which was was pretty impressive. Uh, but, you know, that wasn't enough for a follow through day because it was too soon. That was only day two of a rally attempt. Um, but today's action, I mean, it started really negative, looked like it was going to completely fill that gap up from yesterday. But, man, we really came back at the end. Yeah. You know, what we're we're. Tomorrow and start starting tomorrow. We're recording this on Wednesday, you know, starting Thursday and on. Get another powerful day. We could get that falter day. We could get the market back into a confirmed uptrend. I think that undercut is important though, um, mm -hmm. because you kind of shook out more people. Now, what's interesting, Justin, is you know we we were at the in Las Vegas for the Founders Club event uh, this past weekend, and and a number of us, you know, we all kind of raised our hand, you know, wondering. We, it was a kind of yes or no question, right? Where it was, does is the Nasdaq does the Nasdaq go more than nine percent lower from here or not? And I think almost everyone except you and maybe Chris Gessel, uh, 
said, no, it's not going to go down 9%. Everyone else. By the end of the year. We, we, we did put an expiration year, on by, this. Yes, by, by, by the end of the year, it's going to go down. We, 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 we wanted to make sure we really defined the terms, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And so maybe you guys will be right. Yeah, I mean, uh-huh. the majority was 9 that are saying, yes, yeah, so it's going to go more than down, uh, more than 9% lower by the mm-hmm. end of the year. Uh, mm-hmm. But only two, the only yeah. the, the two swing traders. Yeah, well, and you had uh, you had Jim Ropel and Scott St. Clair on your side, so yes. uh, it's not like you you were all there by yourself. So yeah, we'll, no, we'll see who no, but we might all lose together. The yeah, <laughs> but we'll we'll have to wait and see. But that was almost a perfect contrarian indicator that maybe the market rallies up a little bit here. Maybe two people were getting too bearish at, mm-hmm. at that at that event there. So the market in the end is going to do what it wants to do. That's why you know, as Tom Dorsey said, we like to keep things simple too. If we got a fall today, what we're going to do is we're going to look for something to buy. We're going to look at some of these stocks that are uh, potentially breaking out, and we'll take a shot. We'll buy a little bit, and then we'll let the market tell us if we're right or wrong. And if we're right, we'll start looking for another one uh, to buy and and just use, let the market slowly pull us in. At, at one time, it, it'll keep pulling us in, and other times, it will eventually pull, push us out again and say, no, wait back on the sidelines. So we like to keep it simple, too, and, and uh, we don't want to let our own biases influence us too much. Right, and that's where those risk management rules come into play. Um, you know, if, if we're wrong, if we, you know, if, if we make a choice and decide, okay, we're going in and we're wrong uh, by having those risk management rules in place, cutting our losses uh, when they're small losses instead of letting them become big losses, that's the way that we are able to preserve our capital, live to fight another day. And I'm sure, uh, you know, that's, you know, it's going to remain to be seen how this plays out, but uh, we've seen enough of these uh, corrections to know eventually we will come out of this and when we do there's going to be a lot of opportunities um speaking of which next next week we've got on the show charles harris and talk about a guy that loves to uh take advantage of opportunities in the market i mean this is one of the o'neill global advisors portfolio managers he's been doing that for over 20 years um really good friend and uh just incredible trader. So it's always good to get his take on things. Um, He's usually got so many great insights, whether it's precedents or uh, the individual stocks that he's looking at and why he's sometimes taking contrarian views himself. So it'll be great to hear from Charles Harris next week. So can't wait to have him. Thank you, Arusha, for joining me this week as you do every week. And we will see you all next time. Bye-bye now. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.